Kevin, now Matthew's going to take the time off here because to go and see Phil. And but who's coming up? Robert. Kevin. Good. And Ross will come to the front table, I think. Francis as well. Francis, Kevin, Robert, welcome. The floor is yours. Um, good morning, councillors. Um, so, just under four weeks ago, all the CCOs were in attendance to um, discuss their quarterly performance. So today, uh, today we've kept the focus very much on the, um, the Q1 group results. And also, we've also got transport coming in after this item um, to talk about their um, an update on how they're progressing against the investment against the regional fuel tax. And then a bit later on, we'll use the opportunity to then bring in Hamara <coughs> Housing to give an update on the um, housing for old um, people portfolio. So, um, so for this um, group result um, item, we'd like to take you through some a new format that we've introduced for this um, for this quarter as well as um, then using that to step you through the group performance overview. And then um, Kevin will then step through, I guess, the key highlights from the Auckland Council Entity Summary. Um, so at the uh, 22nd of October FMP workshop, uh, we presented on intended changes to our quarterly um, uh, reporting. This change has been really driven out of the need to drive better transparency in terms of our progress against key LTP initiatives and the SOI that have um, recently been adopted. We also recognise um, you know, the sheer volume in terms of the content that you receive, so we're really trying to make things a lot easier and, and to digest around the whole performance of, of the group. Um, so today we're going to basically step you through the Q1, Q1 results using the new format. Um, we are taking an iterative approach, so you know today you've seen, I guess, the first version, and then <coughs> from that point, we'll obviously base all feedback. We'll continue to build on that and uh, and sort of tailor it so it's um, useful for your needs. Um, this basically from Q2, then will actually the new pack will replace effectively the 250 p um, pages odd of content that you currently get, which is you know um, like I said, is quite hard to um, a lot of information. Um, so basically, um, what am I now moving to the first part of the pack, which is an overview of the um, consolidated results. And that pack is um, basically on the addendum agenda that was sent out. So that's um, a, um, item G, which um, you received yesterday. So if you could... Um, it will step you through the results going through that. So the intention of this pack is effectively, it, it covers the whole group. Um, it gives you a snapshot. There's a section in there in terms of, um, of the overall group results. And then what we use in the pack is a, basically a summary for each of the entities. And that includes the Auckland Council entity and then the five CCOs. Um, so I'll step you through the first part of the pack is which we're now talking about is the overall group results. Um, so in this first page, which you will see on your agenda item or page two, um, what we're using here is just basically a section in this um, um, new format. It's just to continue to um, bring the key um, sort of highlights from the long-term plan <coughs> sort of to the forefront and make sure that we, you know, we continue to be focusing in on what we've um, set as part of the long-term plan process. So the structure of this page is really just recapping on the capital investment the funding sources, and then the operating expenditure. And I guess a key call out here that we continue, you know, we've been talking a lot about through the LTP process is the step up in investment that we're doing through um, from last year to this financial year. Over the page, um, we then step through now to the progress against that investment. And this is the, the snapshot effectively um, from the period of 1 July through to 30 September and how we're <laughs> progressing against our investment at a group level. As you'll see um, on this page and that sort of on the left box there is the progress on the um, capital investment. And to date, we're actually traveling really well for the quarter with um, basically a, a slight underspend of 23 million against our budget of 400 million for the quarter across the group. Now the key area there is uh, Watercare, which is traveling slightly behind. Um, 
I guess a key highlight as well is that that's travelling just under 95% uh, delivery compared to last financial year where it was travelling just over 80%. So, so far from all accounts, uh, we're travelling really, really well. The other, I guess, component of the, um, the pack is that we're calling out the key capital funding sources and how we're travelling against those key funding um, sources for capital investment. So that's that next box <coughs> down on your page. And there we basically, what we've done is we've pulled out sort of the, those key lines. So how we're travelling against the money collected for the water quality targeted rate, the city centre targeted rate, how we're travelling on development contributions, the regional fuel tax, asset <coughs> sales, government subsidies, and obviously the operating cash flow that then is used to fund the capital program. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, call-outs for this quarter, I, I guess we'd just like to note those three at the bottom are travelling behind. Um, at this stage, we obviously have those on our watch list and we are um, working with the relevant um, areas to actually make sure that we're travelling to hit our numbers for the year. The next box I'd just like to call out on that page is obviously our debt to revenue and again a very critical um, part of managing our overall um, funding um, for our capital program. And this uh, again, just a call out for this, um, based off our early projections, we're basically on track for what we agreed as part of the long term plan. Turning the page now, we move over to, um, away from the, I guess, the capital investment to now um, the group operating performance. Um, on this page, I guess a key call out is that we now have got this box here on the left, top left, which is our direct operating performance. So again, this um, is really the, the call out in terms of, um, of how we're travelling in terms of our operational performance. And the, and the way we've structured this up is we really, it's, these, it's the core controllable cost at a group level. So it excludes things like any capital funding that we've actually discussed on the previous page and um, it taken out any uh, sort of the non-cash items. So this is the, really the true operating cash that we, we, um, we um, mm -hmm. actually spending. At a, at a total group level, we're travelling really well um, for the first quarter. So we're $25 million um, um, favourable, which I know the arrow is <coughs> pointing downward, so $25 million to, um, against a budget of of 208 million um, and the, the key drivers there are we're performing quite well so far in our first quarter on our revenue um, we're up six million dollars and we and that's primarily due to our consenting business which has um, um, been performing quite well in the first quarter um, as well as our direct expenditure <coughs> is down by 19 million so again that's uh, you know primary drivers there is lower employee benefits costs that are coming through in the quarter um, and again, that's been seen across primarily the council entity, which we can, can touch on a bit later. Um, the other, I guess, key call out, which we wanted to really, um, I guess, keep a good focus on is our group SCE. And you'll see the movements there from 30 September <coughs> to, I mean, sorry, from 30 June to 30 September, we've increased our group FTE by 117 FTE. Um, and again, the primary area of the, the increase is in um, the Auckland Council entity. A lot of those <coughs> new um, roles are, have been due to regulatory. So again, <coughs> an area of the business that has been um, under-resourced and now they're ramping up with a big recruitment drive. There's also um, uh, some of the other increases are coming through in the community space. Um, Jumping then to the bottom left of the uh, of the box, it really is, it's now sitting around some of those other key operating lines, and again, just to keep a real good focus. So this is again how we are um, progressing against our general rates income, um, and also some of those other um, operating related targeted rates that are primarily funding our operating budgets. So those are things like the waste management, natural environment, <coughs> and the business improvement district. Um, rates and the accommodation provider um, target rates. Um, the other area is also some of the non-cash items, which is still very important for um, for keeping an eye on, such as vested assets, and then the net finance interest and depreciation. Um, I guess the key call out for this quarter is that vested assets. Again, it's an area that we continuously um, seeing that we um, we're basically over exceeding budget. Um, you know, whilst it helps our income line, it's actually, uh, you know, 
does continue to put pressure on our ongoing cost base that we're receiving more assets at, than we intended. So again, we, we're working at, on that and we're looking at that as a, something that will lead into the annual budget and the, and the flow on impacts. Um, then stepping over to the next side of the page, and this again is an area of work in progress as part of the pack, is, is to actually start looking at these cross-cutting, um, or cross-organisational um, initiatives that are, were agreed as part of the long-term plan. So things like the City Centre Development Programme and the um, 36 Americas Cup. So we're calling these out at a group level, not within the um, individual entities, where, where these are delivered as part of um, multiple entities across the council groups, such as Transport, Nuku, and the council entity. So we're pulling this into this, um, I guess, the group overview um, due to the fact that they actually don't sit with one specific um, part of the organisation. Another area which we will continue to, to build on and we haven't included on in this sort of group strategic focus area is Maori outcomes. So it's an area that we're busy working on for the next quarter to actually bring through some good reporting in terms of at that group level, how we're performing across the various entities against um, the agreed outcomes as part of the um, LTP on Maori outcomes. I'll let, now hand over to Kevin to step through the council entity. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, so so as, as Robert mentioned at the beginning of, of the presentation here, um, we're looking for a bit of a consistent format. And so what you'll see is we're actually putting up on the screen today the, the Auckland Council entity. Um, but in the packs you received, you should see that the, the format is similar across all of the six entities that make up the group. So um, what we'll do is just, just talk through the Auckland Council entity as an example of what that looks like. Um, and as Robert also said, quite keen to get your feedback. We're trying to... To, to structure it, to streamline it, to try and point out the key highlights for yourselves as, as governors so you can actually get a good indication of the performance of, of each of the entities in turn. Um, so the first one here, um, top right hand side you'll see is, is those key financial metrics. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are focusing in on those direct controllable type costs. So the figures you'll see here, um, top line is capital delivery. Look, it's, it is running ahead, 118%. Um, primarily driven by the fact we had some works uncompleted at the end of last financial year. So those have flowed into this year, generally being delivered, which means we did start um, on, on, on quite a good uh, position, delivery of those capital programs uh, or projects. The next two lines are these direct ones. So trying to exclude those less controllable, the, the, the non-cash related as well. So direct revenues is looking positive. Um, currently sitting there um, $7.5 million ahead of, of phased budget at this point in time. Um, look, driven by dividends, but also look, fees and user charges. We know that the regulatory area has actually picked up and is currently running slightly ahead of its, of its um, phased budgets. Um, the next line, direct expenditure, is yeah, $1.6 million down on budget, which is a, a good positive result again. Um, and as mentioned for the group, um, that's primarily driven by employee benefits, you know, what, what we generally call staff costs. So good story there as well, which adding those two together, direct revenues is, is ahead, direct expenditure is currently underspent gives us a good net direct expenditure line, $9 million under phased budget. So all good positives on those financials. Um, the next box down is, um, what we've done here is, is tried to pick out a few of the key metrics to give an indication of how the entity is performing. <coughs> so in the case of Auckland Council entity, uh, we've got the five there. Um, and look, we will go through and try and pick out what we believe are the ones that tell um, the, a story, or the story in some cases. Look, the, the first one's a good example though, the percentage of complaints um, or complainants satisfied of noise control services. If you remember, at the end of the last financial year, that was actually a red. Uh, we were not meeting that. Um, there's been reviews of the contracts, there's been some more realistic targeting setting in there, and for those reasons, we actually now have turned that around to a positive, which is a good story. Um, look, jumping through, menacing dogs, it's um, met very close to, so we're actually considering that to be a green. There's good, some good improvement in that area too. The next two, um, you'll notice a bit of a, a change to what you may have seen before, and it's, it's moved in the direction of some of our other discussions as well. There is a strict statutory metric for both building and non-notified resource consents, which is the 20 statutory days. Um, we've always talked about the notion of, to, to a member of our public, one of our customers, they don't really care about the notion of the stopping and starting clocks if there's lack of information. So what you see there, this is true 40 days. So from the day the person puts their application in to the day the actual um, consent is processed, um, did it actually achieve that within 40 days in both cases. And as you'll see there, um, 
the resource consents has still a bit of a way to go there, uh, 59 versus 75, but the building consents is, is, is very, very close now, 58 versus 60. So again, like I say, we've just picked out five here, which we, we think tell a bit of a story around the performance of the Auckland Council entity. Um, I won't go through the other sections of that particular page in detail. What you will see though on the left-hand side in your pack, highlights for the quarter. So we've picked out a few of those. We generally used to show those on one of our opening slides. So this is actually some highlights you should be aware of that are actually being <laughs> achieved for the, for the council entity. And, but then below that, any issues, things that have actually manifested and become an issue for us or potential risks that we think you need to be made aware of. That's in the bottom left-hand side of the pack in front of you. Um, but look, just as importantly, performance is all about where are we today? What does that mean for the future? So the bottom right-hand side of the pack in front of you is actually headed up Outlook for the next quarter. So that's giving some indications. Um, if there are some areas that need improvement, what are we doing, to act, what actions are being taken? Um, but on the, on the other side, there's also just some positives we know of are coming up. So it's telling a bit of a story looking forward. We're trying to link current performance to what we are moving towards. Um, look, we also won't go through on the presentation in front of you um, going through the rest of the CCOs, but um, hopefully if you have had a chance to, to flip through the pack you've got there, you'll see this is the format that we're trying to push for all the six entities. We're trying to, to draw it up to a, to a higher level um, of what is the performance, both financial and non-financial. So quite keen to, to get a feel as to if this is actually meeting your role, as a, if it's meeting the needs of your role as a governor. Um, but also, look, obviously, any questions. It is first quarter, which means it doesn't really start to show true trends of any sort. There are some indicators coming through. Next quarter, we'll, we'll go into more detail on the actual performance underlying. We'll have the, the um, Auckland Council entity and the CCOs as well to answer questions. But I'm um, happy to take questions on the content, but also quite keen to get any comments on the, on the fr framework and the format. Mm. Thank you. Time to look back. Oh, thanks, Ross. We're, we're talking about so just questions or questions? Yep. <coughs> just questions. Um, uh, just a question around the consent targets, uh, Mr. Chair, um, mentioned in those percentages. <coughs> I just, I, I assumed um, that they would be 100%. So could you just explain to us you know, those different levels for the two different types of consents that you just mentioned, Kevin? Thanks. Yep. Yes, you know, thanks for that. You look, no, so through the chair, um, yeah, look, the statutory requirement is to meet 100% um, of consents process within 20 statutory days. Um, that is a legal requirement. Um, and I think you've had comments um, here before around the nature of some of the consents we get in. Um, you know, significantly complex building consents, um, 20 days is... is, is uh, is a very hard target to achieve. To our public though, what's more relevant probably is the day we put a consent application in, when is it actually processed? When is it actually um, completed? So what these metrics are doing are more of our own determined ones. Um, this is actually set our own targets for these, which is okay, we need to ensure that the information being given to us as part of the consent process, um, we get all the information we need up front. So there's a bit of a stricter control process around that, which means we can now try and meet these targets. So these are, the 75% is a target that we've set mm -hmm. ourselves, yep. but we believe it is quite realistic and it's probably more meaningful to our customers right. rather than a statutory one set as a part of the just piece of legislation. Thank okay. you, Kevin. And just, thank a, you. just a second one, Ross, if I may. Thanks. And thank you for that response. Um, and that's just uh, this going up into the public domain as well, because at what point, because it's easy to read and people might be able to digest it, just the mm -hmm. intentions there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, look, we, yeah, we can ensure that we actually tell that story. We do, if in the, um, any of the reports we produce, we actually state the fact that this is not allowing for the stopping and starting of the clock, but we can oh, no, make sorry. sure we make I it mean, quite explicit. I'm sorry, Kevin. The document Just because the whole, yeah, the whole, yeah. Oh, the okay. Metric, yeah, the whole, the graphics and the yep. whole lot, yeah. Yep. So, sorry, just to ch just clarify the question, you're asking how this will be presented? Yeah, just uh, uh, the, how the public get to see this new format and will be available you know, through our website. Oh, okay. Primarily, um, it's been presented here on an open agenda, so this has become a public document, as has the entire addendum there, so this is all now public. Yep. Mm. So, uh, sorry, just, just for clarification, just, just so I'm clear, Kevin. So, so it's obviously on the agenda, it's open, but will it also be published uh, as, like, if people want to search our financial performance through our website. council website, yep. that these, these documents are part of that new system. Mm. 
Yes, we, we, are, we are working with the comms team to see how we can improve that, how we can get these messages out there better, to use a website, other channels, and get greater consistency through how we communicate the long-term plan, the annual report, and then the quarterly results with a similar look and feel. So we're, we're working with that. That is a, a, a pro, uh, something in progress, and we have the comms team come back to you uh, sometime, perhaps next quarter, or <coughs> leading into the next quarter, results with how we can get the message out there better. Oh, that's great. That's, thank you very much. And good, good to hear. Yeah, thanks. Right, <coughs> uh, Councillor Casey, Simpson, <coughs> Wayne Walker, and Councillor Fletcher. Uh, this is probably oh. just a cosmetic thing, but m my, my, my um, eye goes on to red always when I look through any council report. And I expect when I see red and the word not met that there's a reason that I don't have to look for. So I think, you know, the, the reasons are in there, <coughs> but you have to look for them. I think that instead of having that outlook box under there, the next should be the <coughs> explanations for the not met. So it's very, very clear. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, there's something in here that puzzles me, and that's, um, you can get back to me on this, but overall satisfaction with councillor support remains steady at 53%. Um, <coughs> I, I quite like to, we've probably done this before in the past, but quality advice, tech support for elected members, and. The last week I've been in several workshops when I think I've heard every councillor around the table express dissatisfaction with level of support. And that doesn't marry up. So I'm, I'm quite interested maybe to go back to that and maybe have a look at who answered it and whether there's a difference between local board members and councillors. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm asking for because that doesn't match what I know to be true. That's all. Yep, yep, through the chair, we, we can provide more information on that. That was uh, the, the a survey undertaken with all elected members, both local board and governing bodies, so we can provide those details. Councillor yep. Simpson. Um, Mr Chairman, if I could have the lenience to respond to Councillor Casey. I do know, because I chair the quality advice, I do know that a survey is coming to elected members in the next little while. The problem we had um, with the results is only 12, count, 12 people um, replied. replied. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the response, the staff don't get the data to actually do something about it. So I, I take your point, but a survey's coming out shortly, and I would just urge everybody to complete that survey because um, the NZIER results are very, very positive. But sorry, Mr Chairman, if I just go through that. Um, I just want to start by say, uh, commenting a question. I think it's really, really good. Um, I think the format is simple. I think we're, you know, you, you have got not met, but you do have the is issues and risks, and potentially I do support Councillor Casey on that one as well, maybe a little bit more around that not met, but you, you, do have the, you do have the boxes. I think probably in time those boxes might move, <laughs> move depending on, on, um, on the issue. So my question is around, you know, what bothers me considerably um, financially in this council is that actually we are performing pretty well and yet we don't get those good news stories out. Um, like Councillor Casey, the media always look for the red stuff and do a story on the bad, bad stuff. So my question to you is can we give some direction to the comms team to do a series of releases or something on the good stuff? because we just do not tell that story very well and we have to do it better. Um, I'm, I'm the first to admit there are stuff, there's, there, there are issues within the, the council and the finance that we don't, but I just don't think that we're joining the dots up internally. As I said, um, and you've heard me say this before, our results actually are much better than they have been um, and we just need to get those positive stories out. We need to do something about that. So what are we doing about that? Are you guys talking to the comms team, team and giving them a simple fact to help them write positive yep. stories? That's what Ross reiterated. Yes, we're working on that. Right. If you want some help, let me know. <laughs> Council Fletcher. You opened your presentation off by talking about transparency. Could you explain to me why transparency is important, and maybe, because I've just listened to Councillor Simpson, um, where performance and public relations kind of intertwine. So 
So th through the chair, I guess the, the, the concept around the transparency is, you know, a lot of the information that we produce is there. So it is transparent. I think it follows on to what um, Councillor Simpson is saying. So I guess the, what we're referring to there is how we, how we actually package it up so it becomes a lot easier for, for uh, the public and yourself to actually understand exactly the, how we're progressing against some of these very um, important strategic initiatives and how you can actually digest the information in a very, very simple manner and in a more transparent. So, so we're not saying that we're not doing it. I think it just, again, comes back to often how we present the information it becomes quite um, hard for people to actually get a good understanding. You've got to read through a lot of collateral to actually get to the, the key points. I guess um, a supplementary to that would be having worked with the traffic light system for the six years I sat on the board of Auckland Transport, I found it very effective, but it is also, um, it, it can be quite a powerful tool in terms of bringing about those improvements that are required. Um, I'd like you <coughs> to expand further on why transparency in a democratically elected body is important, not just on the public relations side, but why it is actually important. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, the, the, this, through the chair, this could end up huge philosophical dis discussion, which I think is, is quite right. But the core, I think, of what you're saying is the notion of, as a taxing entity, there is extra obligation to ensure transparency about what the funds that we're taking out of people's disposable income is being used for. And it's being used efficiently and effectively to deliver outcomes that have been discussed with the community and agreed to. That's sort of the summary. I think that's sort of the answer that I was looking for. And I would hope that that is your focus and not trying to run public relations sure. companies. Yep. Right, any further questions of the team, Councillor Kicker? Um, thank you. Um, mine was a, you may not know the answer, but I just wondered in the measurements around the not met um, meeting building consents and resource consents as well as we'd like, um, are we drilling down into um, the reality of us having to, the council having to work with CCOs to get comments on resource consents, for example, AET. I know one example, one CCO applying for a resource consent and egregiously AT not responding and it's now to 60 days. So do we actually drill down those kind of things between our group, so-called family, who are we not getting timely responses um, and it holds up major projects? Are we doing any of that sort of measurement? That it's internal mucking about that's making these um, numbers low? Um, yeah, look, through the chair, um, yeah, we have had the regulatory team coming here to talk about results in the past, and, and what they have identified is they've, they've gone down to root cause. They have analysed a lot. <coughs> You've heard quite a bit in the past about um, resourcing, capacity, and there was that, and that's part of the reason why the large increase in, in the Auckland Council entity FD numbers, the 99 increase, there was a, it was across the board, but there was a, a large portion of that was actually filling some of those vacancies we had at the end of last year. And the so council, that's, that's bringing the council, not yes. CCOs, the, yep, the, which the are the ones where I'm asking about their responses, yep, lack of yep, response. Yep. Um, that has been identified in the past. I know there have been improvements made, um, especially of transport. There's been some, some, some greater connections around the resource consent area, which is the primary area where it does involve water care and transport. And then the response that we have had uh, against those actions was there has been improvement in how that's been done. So I, I hope mm -hmm. to see much more improvement. Thank you. All right. Well, there's no further discussion on this. What we're going to do is we're going oh, to take. I, I thought you, Councillor, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Ross. I did. I did have some comments. Comments. Yep. No. Yep. Fine. Was that right? Yep. Yeah, sorry. Yep. I'll do it. I just thought you went questions and then uh, discussion. So, look, couple couple of things I'd just like to say. Um, and I have got a large bouquet in my back pocket here for, uh, for the team too. But I, I, do, I do have to say that um, I completely disagree with the council setting performance targets that are lower than that required um, by the law around the consenting targets. I, I can't support that and, and uh, I, ju I, just, I just think that's wrong. Yeah. However, the, bou the bouquet um, is that, uh, you know, this is, it's just, 
heartening to see such uh, good improvements or continuous improvements in the way that we're reporting our performance, our financial performance, both internally and externally. So uh, well done, and uh, obviously it's a continual process, but it's, it's very good to see that theme. Well, the bouquet is certainly accepted. Uh, Kevin, do you want to respond to the brickbat? <laughs> um, yeah, look, yeah, no, sorry if, yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear earlier on. Uh, through the chair, though, you know, there are, there are some metrics which are around statutory days, um, which are the 20 days we've, we've, we do report to because we are legally re obligated to. But what we have here, uh, what we believe are more meaningful me measures for our customers, which is regardless of the ability to stop and start clocks because we haven't got all the information we need, there is a, a huge push by the regulatory team to say that's that's not what the customer wants to know. They want to know that the day they lodge the application to when the consenting is, the process is completed, how many days have elapsed there. So that is what these metrics are doing. These are self-imposed metrics. They are quite challenging metrics, which they are improving towards, but they are ones we are unable to set ourselves. We will still report on the statutory ones as every local authority has to. Every consenting authority must measure against those. We'll continue to do those but these are ones we think are much more meaningful for a customer perspective. And they're tighter than the law. Yeah, um, well, thank you for the clarification, and uh, I'll be keeping a close case. eye on the uh, statutory performance. Yep. <laughs> Two bouquets. Okay. Councillor Hill. Uh, um, no, thank you. I think my question's been answered because my understanding was actually asking for 40 days is tighter than what we're doing now because you're actually including the when the clock's off. Yes. You're including those real days because the 20 day statutory time frame could actually be six months Absolutely. if the clock is stopped. Um, so, yeah, because that's I, I was concerned when I saw those numbers at first until I understood <laughs> it. So, thank you. Put your bet away, Greg. Yeah. Any um, further comments? Yeah. Right. But well done. Thank, yeah. thank you, team. Yeah, We're like going to take a me. five minute break because I do want to just call up Matthew to check on something, and in the meantime, Auckland Transport can come to the table, Lester and Shane, etc. So five minutes, and that is five minutes, folks.
down there to support us if there's any Lester, specific... Lester can you just pull that whole speaker forward towards sure yourself? Thank you. Is that better? Yep. yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, today we've got uh, Shane Ellison and Mark Lang with us, and to also help us we've got Wally, Cynthia, Mark, Lambert and Randy, all well known to you. Uh, this is actually our first formal report back on the regional field tax since its introduction. Uh, we are only in the first quarter of the financial year, so you will note that a number of the projects um, are uh, to be delivered are either in a design or business case phase, but um, uh, we're starting to get momentum. You'll also see that road safety is a particular key deliverable. Yesterday, our board considered a proposal from management to go to consultation on a new bylaw uh, around reducing speed limits in and around the CBD, the town centres and some rural roads. As a board, we are 100% committed to this intervention, uh, but we did ask uh, management yesterday to uh, bring to the December meeting a paper that has got more detail around the implementation and the communication, uh, particularly around the uh, wider narrative of what we're trying to achieve with this, because the bylaw is, as you will know, a technically complex uh, document. Uh, there will be about 10% of roads that we are proposing uh, should have new speed limits. Uh, but in the bylaw, not only do we need to signal these changes, we need to also remake the speed limits of the existing roads. So the board wanted to make sure that what we put out is easily understandable, um, easily able to be comprehended and reflected on. So that'll come back in December, and we expect that that'll be approved at that meeting. Uh, the consultation will commence as early as possible in the new year, likely the beginning of February. And depending on the outcome of the consultation, uh, a number of uh, speed limit changes will be introduced, and these will be funded by the RFT. We still believe uh, strongly that speed reduction is one of the single biggest contributors to um, behaviour change and road safety and the capacity to reduce death and serious injury rates. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that exists around the world and I think you'd be pleased to know that the 10% of the roads that we are targeting all have defensible cases. There's evidence about why speed should be reduced on those particular roads. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity on behalf of our board to acknowledge uh, yourself, Phil Goff, the Mayor and the Council for actually taking the step, also supported by government, to introduce a regional fuel tax. Uh, we're not naive, we realise how difficult this decision was for you personally and as a group collectively, but it is really important after many years of not wishing to grasp these sort of nettles that they are, because it's absolutely critical that the funding is in place to actually deliver to Auckland what it actually deserves. So um, we uh, want to acknowledge that and, and thank you, and uh, I suppose empathise with you because we know these decisions are, are not easy, but courage is required to make these decisions and you should be congratulated for doing so. Uh, and that is a message from our entire board. Uh, I'll just hand over to uh, Mark, who will take you through a presentation, and then we'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Lester. So, given this is our first report, we felt it was appropriate to do a brief recap on regional fuel tax and what actually it enables. Um, so the Auckland Transport Alignment Plan proposed 28 billion of investment over 10 years. Through the collection of the 1.5 billion of regional fuel tax, which when combined with the NZTA funding and development contributions, will enable 4.5 billion out of the 28 billion of investment. The RFT enables 14 separate projects, or more specifically programs of work, to deliver a safe and reliable transport system. This chart here, which we've included, is just to remind everyone that obviously the, the spend ramps up over the 10-year period. Obviously, there's a lot of 
design and build about to uh, business case to occur in the first couple of years, you'll also see that the, the investment profile ramps up and peaks around 2023 before continuing on. Around 2023, Mill Road commences, and you'll also see then around the, that timing the purchase of additional electric trains to coincide with the opening of CRL. In the first quarter, so for the last three months into 30 September, uh, we enabled 24 million of investment, which had been enabled through 15 million of the regional fuel tax money, which was collected. What we've done on this slide here, and trying to illustrate as an example, just to capture the, the phasing of the various pieces of work, and, and this is how it was reflected um, in the RLTP. So this is the indicative phasing. You'll see a lot of projects do actually go continuously almost throughout the entire 10-year period. You'll notice that the likes of Mill Road and Penlink are more back-ended, and likewise the trains we talked about. Um, would call out that as a management team we are challenging ourselves to try and bring some of these elements forward where possible. So if you take the downtown ferry terminal redevelopment, um, you would have seen through the recent planning for downtown that we're actually looking to substantially complete that piece of work now before the America's Cup. Um, but obviously there's a balancing act in here between ensuring we invest really efficiently and get value for money while also trying to accelerate where, where possible. Just going to now step through each of the specific programs of work that sit in, in underneath there out of the 14. We'll start with safety. So obviously the safety program, um, we've broken down into four broad buckets, um, urban, rural, speed management, which Lester just touched on, and you know, a raft of other initiatives. The urban piece is very much focused on improving high-risk corridors, intersections, pedestrian facilities, and traffic lights. Whereas the rural piece, again, focused on intersections and corridors, but also signage and road, and road markings to address loss of control crash areas. I won't touch any more on the speed management at the moment, um, as it's already, already been touched on, but the other initiatives you'll note in there, there's pieces around safer communities, minor safety, whole raft of activities, and the red light cameras, which we touched on in our last update to Council. On the road corridor piece, Obviously, some well-known pieces of work undertaken there. So Lincoln Road, detailed design is on track. Matakana Link Road, so that's been broken down to stage one and stage two. Stage one being a, a two-lane road to be constructed by late 21. Um, seal extensions, again, key area of focus. You'll notice that we've included in the presentation that we've nine sites have been agreed with the Rodney Local Board you know, progressing to scheme design. <laughs> And then across network capacity and performance, there's obviously a range of activities occurring. Um, and obviously there's a whole raft which we can come back to if there's questions at the end, but you know, there's lots of activity in there to help augment the, the capacity and safety on the network. Bus priority improvements. We're taking a bit of a different approach in this area. We're looking at doing integrated corridor business cases, so taking an all of corridor approach. We think this will deliver the best customer outcomes and value for money. It is a, a bit of a different approach for us, but we, we do think it's the right way to proceed. And you'll notice there also, then the Puanui interchange <coughs> we're looking to complete prior to America's Cup, in addition also to of the, the bus infrastructure hubs. And Amity continues to track along um, according to plan. Touched on downtown ferry terminal, obviously we've talked about this reverse sawtooth and again we're looking at doing it in one hit rather than doing a temporary and then a, a second stage development <coughs> later. Uh, and Penlink, we are in the process of updating the business case just to work with council to see if, if it w would be possible to bring forward but without impacting the council's balance sheet. And you would have noticed in the actual last report there was a little bit of spend on Mill Road but that's completing some land acquisitions that had previously commenced and negotiations underway, but the project itself was back-ended in, in the 10-year period. And lastly, these four projects on this page, we haven't actually spent any RFT money on as of yet. Um, park and rides, active transport, and the trains, there are actually non-RFT projects already underway in those areas, and so it's, uh, once those are complete, then the RFT money will begin to be invested in those areas. And then obviously the growth related transport infrastructure, um, obviously an announcement the other day about COP Wainui, um, obviously AT's contribution has rolled up into that investment along with Whanua Pai and Red Hills. 
So if we summarise, um, obviously the regional fuel tax is enabling much larger investment in transport and in the areas most needed. It will provide increased public transport and active modes and assist in growth in Greenfields areas. So with that, I'll hand back to Lester. Thanks, Mark. So uh, we are taking very seriously re the fiscal responsibility around this as we do, but in this particular uh, line of funding, we will just make sure that we're able to transparently report to you uh, the receipt of the funding, where it's being deployed, and what the results are. So there's a discrete report that comes out that looks very specifically at RFT, so people know what's being spent, how much is being spent, what it's being spent on, and what the outcomes delivered are. So we'd be grateful to appreciate any questions you have. Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, just got a bigger question around um, cost overruns, and <coughs> I, I just put that in the context of the regional fuel tax. So we know that we're going to know early next year when the tender prices for the CRL come in as to whether it's within budget or whether it's significantly over uh, budget. In an instance where the costs have gone up and the council has to find uh, money and it's, it's not allowed for in our long-term plan, and even with a, an increase in contribution from uh, the government, we still have to find uh, money. Um, quite obviously, we'll have to revisit our um, long-term plan. Is it conceivable that we might have to look at the allocation of money from the regional fuel tax? And will there also be a process within that if we've got cost overruns? Yeah, well, um, so uh, we aren't responsible for managing the budget for CRL. Uh, we would expect those who are to do that within the parameters, if that's possible. Uh, in terms of our own organisation, we've made very clear that the organisation is undergoing change. Uh, the board has had concerns around a number of issues. We've been pretty transparent about those. We've had a number of business um, uh, reviews that were independent and uh, one of the areas that we are targeting and have been targeting in our organisation is procurement. Uh, we need um, more secure early forecasting of costs. We need to lock and load what projects will cost and we need projects delivered around that. We cannot have the uh, process where uh, people come late and there's changes and the early work isn't robust enough. So there's a lot of work going on around that, and I mean, we just had this discussion at our finance committee just recently. We are at the point now where the budget will be the budget, and that needs to be delivered on, and uh, management needs to ensure that it is. Uh, Shane may want to pick that up because he's very active with Mark in this particular area, and we've got some good work going on. But we, we, we expect that for the regional fuel tax that we need to deliver what we said we're going to deliver. We're not expecting this money to be diverted elsewhere, and we're expecting to <coughs> deliver value for money in this particular area. Shane. Can I just get Ross to clarify as to why we cannot, uh, Councillor Wall? Okay, so we, we have to work within the process of the enabling legislation for the fuel tax. So for us to re-divert fuel tax funding to another major project, it would have to create a new uh, proposal, <coughs> a variation to our fuel tax proposal. We have to publicly consult on that, and that would need to be approved by, by ministers. Um, the legislation requires that, or well, only allows the fuel tax money to be, to be allowed for new investment that couldn't otherwise be funded. So we have to arrange a, a set of criteria like that. But there is this whole statutory process, process would have to go through before you'd be able to make calls about re-diverting money. Yep. Councillor Casey. Well, a comment and a couple of questions. First of all, just to thank Shane for fronting the six demographic panels the other week with Wally answering copious questions and did very well indeed. Also, the ele um, 11 elected members, 11 councillors present and the whole um, council leadership team. Excellent, excellent responses. One of those questions that came up again and again from all the panels was personal safety. And there may be an action arising from that that you don't know about yet, but uh, there's no hint of that in the way you report to us. So it is of concern to the community about being safe 
at stations and on public transport, but I can't find anything in the way you're reporting to us that addresses that. So just that was my comment. So thank you, Shane, for coming. My second question relates to when you have three not mets, I'd quite like to see them up front and with the explanation next to them, because that's in, in the I'm looking at this document here. It's in your report and you have to go look, see what the reason is. And probably I'll ask you about one of them, which is the cycleway. Was that the, the reduction in the build? Is that simply due to the New Lynn fiasco? Um, um, not Greyland, sorry, not New Lynn. Sorry. <laughs> New Lynn's yeah, and is it on track for the rest of the year? Sir, can you just confirm? Sorry, Councillor, can you not please met. confirm? Not Cycleway build, not met. Is it the RFT report or is that the... It's in your, it's in your big report here. It's on our page. 37 kilometres of new cycle we added to the regional cycle network. So is it in our, in our quarterly report or is it in the regional fuel tax report? It's quarterly oh, you're report. doing the fuel tax? Yeah. 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 <laughs> can you save that question for... Yeah. When yes, we, I can remember it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll email the response. Did you hear me? Yeah. No, I didn't hear you. Oh, it's, all, it's all good. <laughs> you can see it, I'll get it later. It's fine. Yeah. We'll revert. It's fine. So you want a response back on Greyland and New Lynn? No. I just want to know that you're meeting the 10k per year. So we, we'll send, we are, a, we'll send an email response. Yeah. Yeah. So we, are, we are pushing ahead with all the walking and cycling projects. Which includes the Tafo Coastal Walkway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God. Yeah. God. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to the AT team. Look, um, just three questions. Um, obviously, when we put a levy in like the regional fuel tax, um, people are okay with that if they know where it's being spent, and that means the whole emphasis comes on our communication of what we're doing. And I, my first question is about your website. <clears throat> For example, I looked up the website this morning, uh, printed it out on Penlink, and the latest update was February 2017. And the, if you were just relying on the website, you would think that Penlink wasn't going to occur until the second decade, uh, which is you know uh, <coughs> over, over 10 years out. I, I'm just wondering, don't you have to do something to bring your website up to date so that people can go there and see what's happening uh, in, in real time, not what the, what the position was, uh, which is, in this case, 15, 16 months ago. So your website's not really helping the selling of what we're spending the money on and what we're now capable of doing because <coughs> of the RFT. Maybe Wally would Wally. come up. Here comes the website guru. Yeah, um, kia ora, councillors. Um, Mr Mayor, thank you for that. Um, thanks. I, I'll, I'll definitely pick that up and acknowledge that um, our website um, does, does need um, constant refreshing. Um, just in terms of, uh, of general comms around um, regional fuel tax, um, each project that is either funded or partly funded um, by the RFT has its own comms plan, consultation, engagement plans. And the fact that it is regional fuel tax funded is, um, is a key message and a, and a key strand to those comms plans. Um, and as we saw in the presentation and Lester alluded to, a lot of these projects have, have reasonably long lead times. So at this point, we've got a lot of projects in business case stage or design stage. So um, uh, with the exception of the um, red light cameras and uh, the Eastern Busway, Mr Mayor, which are, you're going out to tomorrow, um, and the upcoming announcement around Puanui Station, you know, we haven't had a lot of um, announcements to be able to make around key milestones that public are going to see. One of the other things that we have uh, done and have been working with uh, council staff on uh, is some branding concepts for regional fuel tax um, funded projects. So um, all the collateral, uh, so this is your, your brochures, your consultation material, your on-site construction signage, will have a, have, a, have a logo with something along the lines of um, powered by your regional fuel tax or um, brought to you, or made possible by the regional fuel tax. So we are trying to really raise the visibility of, of what the, the fuel tax is delivering for yeah. the people. Yeah, because when, when we did a survey on visibility among the public, yeah. um, which is, was presented earlier uh, today, 
uh, it's actually dropped. And the, you know, we, we got a whole, whole lot at the time of ATAT, yeah. but the profile has dropped, and all people are seeing are the costs and not the benefits. So uh, anyway, the, the website was just one element of that. Um, the, the other two questions I've got are about the specific areas, uh, two specific areas. One is road safety, and uh, for some reason I'm quoted in the Herald as not being in favour of dropping speed limits. Um, actually, if you see the, what was quoted, what I said was much clearer than that. I'm in favour of it when you produce the empirical evidence. Uh, you have done for me, I'm not sure you've done it for the other councillors, but there were two examples you gave me, I think one was... Uh, Wynyard Quarter and the other was another part of the CBD and you had some quite clear statistical evidence of the impact of that. Would you like to re relay that to, to other councillors? So just while Randy is uh, coming up, uh, part of what the board was asking yesterday uh, in this paper being brought back is more emphasis on the wider story, so each program in the wider context as well. So uh, that, I think you'll start to see that as these programs um, unfold, they'll always be connected back to the wider picture, not just these programs just independently ad hoc by themselves. Randy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, look, very good point, Mr. Mayor, and I remember the conversation that we did have a few weeks ago about um, some of the uh, specific benefits within the CBD in particular. Um, there were three corridors we talked about that had specific benefits um, where we reduced the um, speed limits. Queen Street was one of them where we had reduced the speed limits um, approximately seven or eight years ago. And what we were seeing um, on Queen Street was a reduction in crashes, deaths and serious injury crashes to the tune <coughs> of uh, close to 50% reduction post-implementation of the 30k speed limit. Um, the other example was Ponsonby Road, um, where back in 2007 we'd reduced the speed limit to 40 kilometres per hour, and uh, that again had uh, significant benefits where we reduced the um, death and serious injury rates by close to 60%, um, in particular of noting in the period before we'd implemented the speed changes there were two fatal crashes, and post that period there were none. So they, they're definitely very impactful. Um, in the Wynyard Quarter, it's only a year on, we've reduced um, the speed limits in the Wynyard Quarter on a number of, of streets within the area, and um, we're already starting to see around a 30% reduction in the um, safety um, performance or the improvement of the safety performance on, on those corridors. So there's definitely some good examples. Um, once again, we take your point, Mr. Mayor, and we're actively pushing out some of the um, empirical evidence and information, not just locally, but also the good international evidence that we have that demonstrates the value of speed management, and that'll be part of our comms going forward. And the interesting thing is that this information does not only um, provide evidence that when you reduce speed that the statistics improve, they also show areas where people have increased the speeds and where road safety statistics have deteriorated. It's pretty consistent. Yeah, it's an important message to get across. Uh, my, my last question uh, was just the, so that councillors had an update on uh, the red light uh, cameras, because I think there was quite a bit of discontent and justifiably around this table when we figured that we were spending millions of dollars on speed uh, uh, on red light cameras, <coughs> and then the government was saying, or the police were saying, uh, sorry, we can't enforce them. Can you give us an update on where we've got after our efforts with central government on that issue? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I do recall the question coming at the last finance and performance meeting, which uh, Andrew Allen responded to. Um, the situation's been changing fairly rapidly since that time, and it's fair to say that um, we are getting much, uh, very strong support around uh, from New Zealand Police, NZTA, and the Ministry of Transport. Uh, to uh, make the changes to the back office system to support um, increased um, processing of infringement notices for uh, red light cameras. And in fact, they have asked us to, for two options to accelerate the program, uh, accelerate the program of procurement of red light cameras, uh, and we've provided them with two options. One's a three year and one's a five year plan. Uh, rather than being a 10-year plan. So it is moving very positively, and uh, we thank you for your advocacy. 
Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Mr Chair. Councillor Newman. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, would it be Auckland Transport's professional judgment that the Council uh, should not proceed with structure planning and live zoning at Drury and Pairata prior to the delivery or prior to the commencement of improvements around Mill Road commencing in 2023 um, and noting that the Mill Road corridor isn't actually a full corridor for the conveyance of people and freight, it's, it's partial. Um, would it be AT's professional judgment that we should not proceed with structure planning and live zoning at that site until we have commenced that work? The Chair, Councillor, thank you for your question. Um, I'm not going to offer a professional opinion. We haven't done that work. We are supporting Council to make sure we unlock um, growth for Auckland, which is <coughs> seriously important. Um, and I think is it's a difficult piece of work for us. It's because it is so far away from Auckland. And you know, we're starting to talk about that linear city and I've talked about it before. But certainly I think uh, we would be um, remiss if we didn't support council trying to plan and make sure that we are grow growing for Auckland. I think we would be making a, big, a grave mistake by not pursuing. Is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. Will it be costly? Yes, it'll be costly. But truly, we cannot leave Auckland um, in the state it's in right now. Will the local network um, improve in terms of its uh, efficient conveyance of people and freight uh, if we live zone the sites and don't have the Mill Road corridor ready uh, just in time? Councillor, I think uh, that it will put significant pressure on uh, the network if we don't have the full Mill Road. Yes, I do. do. I think the modelling, um, I haven't seen the modelling, but I think um, from what I understand, the modelling would show that, yes, the network would be under considerable stress. What risks does the CRL pose uh, to the efficient conveyance of traffic across Auckland Transport's local network uh, beyond the CBD, specifically on roads where we have level crossings as opposed to grade separation? Council, thank you. Good RFT question. Um, I think that uh, I think that anywhere in the world where you have level crossings on your network, you will have uh, congestion, you will have safety issues, and it certainly would be my preference, and I can't speak for the board because we have not taken it to the board, that uh, we have uh, level crossings not on our network at all but um, understanding that we've pushed hard through the RFT process to make sure they're strategic asset and that they're picked up in the transitional rail um, program. And I guess this predates Cynthia, but the board has had a clear position that it would like a program and process and funding to remove all of those because they are an impediment. And as things get bigger, faster, busier, they become more of an impediment. And what will be the timing of your bid to the governing body for that program of work to be um, funded uh, so that we can complete that? Councillor, it's in RLTP um, and it's in transitional rail. So we will uh, we'll work with Kiwi Rail and government. And I understand there was an announcement recently I'd have to recall it, about the level crossings and the government's commitment to level crossings based on safety and the congestion issue. And I think we have seen, uh, with a change of government, a greater receptor site for this kind of approach. Final question, Chair, if I may. Um, should the CRL project as a whole be rescoped to include grade separation given the consequential impact of increasing um, commuter rail because of the CRL um, and the consequential impact of the barrier arms being down at intersections where there isn't grade separation and the consequential need to address that. Yeah, so I guess it's also a philosophical issue and it's one that uh, we have discussed and raised including with government uh, previously. 
uh, that there was always a approach that you've got the CRL, but that's not independent on a significant number of adjustments, enhancements, and investments into the overall rail network. And part of those were part of that, and that you shouldn't be considering the CRL as a solution independent of those. They understand that, they know that, Key Rail know that, and that's why hopefully all of that gets picked up in this planning process. But it's never been anticipated, and we were very clear about this, that the CRL investment would solve all of those problems. They need to be solved concurrently. I'll, I'll take this up offline, Chair, and I just want to uh, express my thanks to the Chief Executive for his uh, uh, making himself available for the site tour with me uh, and for the consequential improvements that have taken place. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, uh, another good RFT question, uh, hopefully. Um, just on the communications over the, the road safety program, uh, currently uh, some of your officers are going around the councils and local boards explaining it, uh, Jonathan Anion and um, Michael Brown, giving, giving a, a very good uh, persuasive pitch, I might add. And we understand this, the example in the... Um, the city centre, we're, we're basically, you know, you're only speeding up to go from red light to red light. Obviously, out in the suburbs, it's going to be a little bit uh, a more uh, sensitive issue where, where there's, a, there's a bit more um, kickback, I would suggest. Now, they had a couple or at least one extremely good example of an outlying area, a semi-rural, <coughs> where there had been huge resistance, where um, the the... The change was made, the uh, ca crash results plummeted dramatically, and where we had the ironic um, uh, output where the, the once opponents of the increase were now fervent supporters and looking for it to be actually extended. So I would just uh, make an, uh, another request, if, if it hasn't already been made clear, that as much be done to, to, to communicate with live examples uh, that people can relate to, because it certainly made an impact on me, and, and I think to any reasonable person it, it will do elsewhere. Um, my, my question, however, and in, in, in part goes to uh, communication too, just uh, in respect of the, the Penlink uh, pro project, and I, I know that, again, we appreciate the updates that, that AT are given, that's... And, and I'm just checking, a, you know, a, a comma or a semicolon or a parenthesis hasn't been left out here. The, the, the two words next year suggest that we're considering bringing it forward that, that much, because um, um, that's the way it, it reads from the, the slide. Um, through you, Chair. We are always looking uh, at opportunities where we can makes sense to advance projects. We know that um, if we can bring improvements to Aucklanders um, across the region, then that's we are open to uh, having those conversations, but it has to be done in the context of uh, Council's balance sheet, the priorities that have been established under ATAP, uh, and those sorts of things. Okay. So, so I just would say in terms of that communication, I think it's, it's very useful, again, for the overall regional fuel tax pitch to let the public know that this is constantly happening and while there is timelines that are you know, are often very disappointing to some parts of the community, that it's useful to know that AT actually using, looking actively to, to further it and to get these results or these gains on the ground as quickly as they can and it's not necessarily set in stone. Correct, it, it, but just to clarify, if we, in the cases that we do, we are able or were able to bring projects forward, it may not necessarily be through the use of regional fuel tax at that particular time. Okay. And Councillor Hill. Um, thank you, Chair. So we were only allowed to ask questions on the RFT. Yep. Yep. Despite yep. everything else on the agenda, we're... Oh, next stop. Wait. Next stop. How about we just keep on going on RFT for those who've got questions on okay. that? Because we're running yes, into a bit of a bottleneck here. Um, we're supposed to be adjourning at 11.30, and um, I don't mm. think we're going to be no. asking Lester and Jane and Mark to come back at 1 o'clock. So Inesco. let's just keep... 
Uh, yeah, but will we get another I'm opportunity to ask questions? Well, at this time, because I don't think they're going to come back after yeah. one. We're, we're running into okay. a bit of a um, dilemma well, here. Well, I guess first question on RFT is, um, why does Project 9 have nothing in it, which is active transport, in the, the list at the asterisk through... I can speak to that. Sorry. So that's the active cycling program at the moment is the UCP. Once that's completed, then the, the next cycling program kicks in, which is RFT funded. Because we're doing the UCP programs first, the, UC the RFT money is not currently getting spent. Urban cycleway program. Ur yeah. Urban cycleway program. Yeah. Um, the, okay, so... It's existing funding, and when that finishes, this funding commences. Correct. RFT was for new projects rather than existing projects that or programs that were underway. Okay, and then it's saying that, back to Cathy's point, and I think it is related then, um, how will you get to the 10Ks if you're at 0 0.9 at the moment? At what is the projection looking like on cycleway? cycleway? Yep, so we had a, we are working through, we're about to go to market uh, on Newland to Avondale, for example. There have been a number of projects where we've done some wee work on them. Um, and uh, looking to push ahead with those. We don't see any reason for not achieving the target at this point in time. Okay. And the other one, so on safety, thank you for this. I think we have seen a major ramp up in my, my community. I know, you know, 12 pedestrian crossings and something else coming, which is fantastic. But I think um, on the safety the 30k zones and others, you know, that we un unanimously supported that, and I know it's only a short delay, but what, um, I am concerned that we seem to be tempering off a little bit, and I would have thought the evidence is people are dying and getting run over, so, yep. and if traffic's slow, it's slow. So I, I, I just... Yeah, so I, there's, no, I, there's no tempering off at all, um, but the board received the paper yesterday, had a detailed discussion. It is critical that... Um, the board plays its role, which is to stress test everything, and there are detail around implementation and communication that just need further work. It's, uh, if it wasn't uh, December, then we would start the consultation at the beginning of January, but that's not a good time, so we'll start uh, beginning of February. But there is zero tempering off. The, the, this is the number one priority. There is a united resolution within the board and management Okay. to do this uh, but we also do have to do it right and communication is a critical part of it as many of you have pointed out to us before okay and my last um, thing on on safety and I know <coughs> we kind of bundle road safety over here and that was the number one uh, priority for the LTP and for the RLTP and the regional fuel tax discussion um, but are you including walking and cycling projects within the road safety gambit and not separated them out, and I know both of you have said to me you're confident that walking and cycling is not being reduced or anything, and I believe you, but I just want to make sure that actually separated cycleways and safety for pedestrians is obviously included in road safety. They are, but from a funding perspective, they're separate buckets okay. of money. So we have absolute transparency about what's being spent, what projects are being done. I think it's just worth saying, Mr Chair, is that... Um, you know, there's probably nothing that I personally take more flack on than cycling. It's not possible for me to go anywhere anymore because you're just under constant attack on cycling. Uh, we aren't uh, at AT, at the board, ideologically for or against anything. Uh, we just uh, look at the evidence uh, and see what's happening. And realistically, um, there are a lot of opponents to cycling and cycleways. Uh, this will be dealt with over time because people will see how this will um, uh, increase and that the option will be taken up more and more. And I've said that before in this forum. I think cycling and walking are amongst the biggest game changers around modal shift. And it's just a matter of time. So we absolutely determined on that. And we plan to continue. And uh, over time, you know, if you take the long lens, uh, four, five, six years time, I think it'll be a very different picture. But we have to move with determination to get these done, to get them done properly, and to get them connected. That is the critical part. 
There are um, quite inaccurate reports in the media in recent times. Um, and that's unfortunate. Thank you for replying on the actual figures yesterday. So that's you. true. I, I did, just if I may digress very briefly, uh, my daughter studied journalism and I was always quite interested in what she was reading. Um, uh, and she gave, I said, what is the most interesting thing you learned? And she gave me a paper that was written in the top journalism <coughs> study journal. So I'm quoting now from a top academic peer-reviewed journal on journalism. And she showed me this quote, and it goes like this. Journalism and inaccuracy, after flirting with each other for many years, have now got their lips firmly locked. <laughs> okay. So I'll leave it to the academic journalist to... Um, <laughs> but there you go. So that is something we have to deal with. <clears throat> that sounds almost exactly what Donald Trump says. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you, Something Donald right? Trump won't be writing in any <laughs> academic journal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Hills. Now, we've got a dilemma here, guys. We've got Councillor Cashmore, Filipona, Cooper, Simpson, Lee, and I was going to say something, but I'll hold back. Simpson we've only got Simpson. 10 minutes, actually. So, Councillor Cashmore. No, I can. Okay, Councillor Filipona. Can. Can you do the... Councillor can. Cooper. Can I do what? No, well, uh, the thing is, I've already been... If we're only allowed to ask one, uh, the question on... No, no, you're next. You, you go ahead. OK, good. So, m three questions. One is, you have a measure for local board satisfaction, um, but there are elected member relationship staff, so can we have a measure for ward councillor satisfaction? Um, the other one is around the cycleway, and I'm, and I'm going to put that in safety. You've got standards for road maintenance, um, it says road assets, but I'm not clear whether that's satisfaction with cycleway safety or condition. Um, and that's on-road and off-road, because there seems to be no measure for how much they're swept, clean, get the rubbish out, gravel off, and that is critical for cycle safety, because otherwise people ride on the road. So I'd really, if we could have a measure for that, because um, it is critical if you, if. If the cycle haters want us off the road, we have to have clean cycleways. Um, and the other one is around just what... It, it, it isn't about the... Um, fuel tax. Fuel tax, but I don't know when we're going to get to speak otherwise. Mine's just about... Cynthia was quite right. The job is to help unlock potential and work with us to deliver transformation and unlocking around the country. So I guess for me just... And it alludes to what I said earlier around CCOs working together to help unlock and transform. And I just want you to know that in your organisation you've got people holding up the single most critical, tiny resource consent to unlock Henderson. And it's been waiting for 60 days. And so I know you're doing a tr you are doing a transformation in your organisation, so I'd ask you to look at that sort of inter-family stuff and help us deliver on what we're trying to do in Auckland, because this is just silly. So um, those are the sort of things I'm really asking, that you could you know, make sure our relationships between CCOs work and our regulatory department. <laughs> and it is really a bit of a follow-up to, to what was passed on to Cynthia just the other day about you know latching into the Panuku work program which is unlock and transform, those are our priorities um, and if local boards are banging away about something else that's much more important then that's, that's not the case. Work with the CCOs. The Nuka work program and the one local board initiatives that are the keys, the we've arm. long established that so I'm going to go to so Councillor Simpson. This is the one I'll, be, I'll just do one because we're at time and essence on the regional fuel tax which is what we're supposed to be talking about. How many actual projects are only funded by the regional fuel tax as opposed to being topped up? None, None. right? This is a finance meeting, and I can see that you, um, you've put the 14 projects and you've put the RFT contribution. I just think that um, we need to keep monitoring. You, we need to first set the... Um, you, you, you've got... So let, let me just understand this... Um, second slide. 
So you've got, there are 14 projects. The RFT uh, <coughs> annual contribution is the next column, correct? correct? That's right. That's the life of the project. Over X year. So what, what I think what we need to see, so people are paying the fuel tax every day. They absolutely need to say, see that instead of just park and rides, it is what park and rides, where, and they need to see what RFT money has gone into that. This is, has to be something that's completely transparent. And at the moment, if you were looking at this, you wouldn't know whether they're in your area, this area, that area, that, that area. Um, so I just think that we just need to do some tightening around how we transparently tell Aucklanders exactly when they fill up at the pump, where that money no is going and comment. how it actually gets, but no what, what's the benefit and where. And I just don't think I want to comment. this column does it. Okay, we do have that information and we will <coughs> make that available. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Lee. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, I haven't joined in the questioning um, at these sessions in, in recent times. Uh, I think my last... Um, the time for questioning was over the battery train issues which you came to ask us for last year, about this time last year. Thankfully, good sense has prevailed and hopefully the board and management are on side about that one. I, I want to ask a question relating to this regional fuel tax and as you know, uh, the regional fuel tax is controversial in Auckland and um, around the country, in fact so controversial that the rest of the country is not going to have one. Um, however, um, in regard to the um, speed reduction uh, safety matter, I um, commend the board for calling time out on this. It, it, it is going to be a very tough call to explain to Aucklanders, given the regional fuel tax is meant to solve the problem of congestion why AT um, wants to slow down uh, traffic speeds in the inner city. And I'm, um, Mr Levy, I'm, I'm still waiting for a response from Mr Andrew Allen uh, to a letter I wrote um, with a number of questions about a month ago, especially in regard to the number of deaths or injuries and the nature of those accidents in my ward, the inner city, over the last five years. Uh, however, um, what I'm concerned about in particular is the um, improving airport access uh, program uh, relating to Puanui Station. I should mention at this stage, no one else has, um, con my concern about the, the disquieting news that four business cases for cycleways have been flawed. Um, and I'm interested that there's been no explanation <coughs> over that. Um, however, um, these have been described as a sham or even rigged. Uh, however, hopefully there will be an ex explanation forthcoming that these fears are misplaced. However, in regard to improving airport access, this is not, if there is something wrong, seriously wrong with that business case, it won't be the first one because I recall the business case to exclude the previously agreed consensus on a future heavy rail connection to Auckland International Airport. That business case was deeply flawed too, in my view. However, in regard to this Puanui station work, can I have um, Auckland Transport's assurance that the work that the regional fuel tax will be paying um, in that area uh, will not um, mean that a f the future option of a heavy rail connection from Puanui will be blocked, as it was blocked by AT by um, lowering Nielsen Street across the rail corridor immediately south of the Onihunga station. So could I have that assurance, please? Councillor, through the Chair, thank you for your um, discussion about Puanui. Uh, Puanui for me is probably one of the most important projects we're going to deliver in the next few years. We're under very tight constraints for time. Um, it will be the gateway for Auckland um, from the airport. 
um, and there will not be heavy rail considered in that business case. We have a resolution from NZTA councillor that says that heavy rail is not to be considered um, any further and we will not be pursuing it. Well, that, that is not the question and actually when it comes to national policy making, I don't think with all due respect um, that is really your call. What I want is the assurance that the future link supported heavy rail link supported by the majority of, of, of parties in the New Zealand Parliament, including the National Party, will not be precluded or foreclosed by any work that you're carrying out at Puanui as you did at Onihanga. Can I have that assurance, please, again? Councillor, I can't give you that assurance. Um, we are doing a business case, and the business case is not completed yet. We're working on it now to transform uh, Puanui as an interchange at this point in time it is a light rail bus interchange for people to use uh, those modes I can't give you that assurance councillor my apologies can I chair can I take the opportunity to respond to the other question around the business cases mm -hmm. please in terms yep. of walking yep. and cycling um, there has been articles published in the last 24 hours around business cases um, the, what I would say in response to that is Auckland cycle infrastructure is performing well and we are confident that the investment is delivering the expected results and benefits. As we add more safe and protected infrastructure to the network, we are seeing the numerous increase exponentially that we are seeing, which is consistent with the modelling we use. The article that was published did not make clear that the numbers that were projected for were for 2026, not 2018. Um, we also have to say that the report on which the article was based is not an official report. It has not been quality assured. It is not an AT document. Thank you for that. Um, no doubt um, w this case will unfold, but it would have been better and, and, and more convincing if you had offered that explanation at the very start. It is a matter of, of widespread concern. So this was published, our response was published yesterday, as straight after the article was published. This, this is the Finance and Performance Committee. It would be, has it been good and respectful had you told us what you're just telling us now? That's the end of the questions. I'll we'll see more about this, I'm sure. Philip, I last it's, it's, brief it's, comment. Just, please, it, brief. It, it's going to be very brief, and, and I'll be remiss not to acknowledge, uh, obviously, Transport the Board, but in particular, uh, Wally, uh, Shane, and, and also Mark Lambert, because the list of projects in the Manuko ward that he sent me, I forwarded on to the local board. So that gives us at least something, and that stemmed from the meeting I had with you, Shane and with Wally and with the Fessel. So thank you to that because um, that's been forwarded and it outlines all the projects in the Manukau ward. So for those that uh, want to get your own in the ward, please contact those people. So thank you. All right, thank you, team. Uh, Lester, just um, I hear your comments about getting a lot of heat about cycling. I'll just say one thing, I'll just pass on anecdotally, and we have a number of times. The more and more shared paths you do as compared to cycling routes, you know, so cyclists still, you're going to get way better acceptance by the public and because you can cycle and you can do everything on them. But I just pass that comment on. Thank you. Thank you. Radio, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. I want you to put the high fences up, though. Right, clear. And uh, Tamaki uh, redevelopment. Oh, sorry, we need to pass a resolution to agree to no, adjourn. Uh, okay, I'll move that. Seconded by Councillor Simpson. We're adjourning uh, item eight, and we're now going to item nine. So I'll move that. Seconded by Councillor Simpson. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Oh, it's a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> well, we're not. For that, right. We've now got clear and... and, and uh, We're not going to the music.